Thank you, Lynette, for the beautiful music. And welcome, friends and neighbors. What a wonderful way to start a Sunday morning worshiping together in the house of the Lord. And to all of you joining us online, we welcome your presence also. I would like to welcome back Reverend Tim McCalmott. Uh, he has been here before, so we are Looking forward to hearing the message that you have to bring us. A couple of announcements for today. On next Sunday at the 9 a.m. Uplift service, they will be celebrating back to school. So if you are a teacher or a student or just a friend or a neighbor, please spread the word and um, go to the 9 o'clock service to get the school year off to a good start. And I believe Reverend Jeff will be back from his much deserved vacation on that day. Also, there are just two Sundays left in August in which you could join the summer choir. And I know those who haven't sung in ages are getting a crinkly voice like mine, but I have it on good authority if you can make a joyful noise that sitting among these gifted Kirk choir singers will make you sound like an angel. In fact, I challenge you, I'll be there next Sunday at 10 o'clock in the choir room if you will join me. How's that? <laughs> okay, as we quiet our hearts and open our mind to God, let us read the responsive call to worship. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend your money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good, for your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Hear me, that your soul may live. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Please stand for our hymn of praise.
Would you please join me in the confession of sin responsibly? Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sinful ways, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts, wash us clean from all our offenses and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires, that with humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding refuge through Jesus Christ, your Son. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone. A new life has begun. We are forgiven. Amen. opportunity to greet your friends and neighbors and give them the peace of God.
That'll wake you up, huh? I saw you starting to dance. You're starting to move a little bit there. It's good for us Presbyterians, isn't it? The frozen chosen. I don't like that. Sydney, come on, come on. Hey, it's good to be back with you again. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come again to Fullerton. My friend Jeff and his wife Carol are long-term friends, and uh, uh, whenever he goes away, he rings me up, or whatever it is on your cell phone now. I don't know if it's a ring anymore, <laughs> but it's good to be here. Thank you for joining with us. Our scripture this morning is taken from Paul's letter to the Philippian church, and it begins in, in verse 4 in chapter 4, so let's listen for the word of God. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. This past, this past spring has been a memorable one. Started around Easter time, and Easter, as with many of you, I'm sure, we had the family over. And as the lights move, <laughs> that was spooky, the first service. It's, it's really strange here. <laughs> but on Easter Day, we had the family over, and we had a great family meal, and we joined in some games. And then we all went out on the front porch, and we took a picture. We all do that. And uh, as the family then prepared to leave and got in their cars to head home. Ruth turned and went to the back to the house and she tripped on the step of the porch and she fell and she fractured her left tibial plateau, which is the little shelf at the top of the tibia that holds your knee. And it was a stress fracture, so we didn't find out about it uh, except for a little bit of pain, till several days later. But then we went through all these medical examinations and assessments, and they finally put her in a brace, which she was in for about four and a half weeks, unable to put any pressure on her left leg. Well, all this time we were planning a trip that we had set on our calendar to go to Italy and Greece on a cruise. Well, you can imagine the crimp that put in those plans, and so we thought, well, can we still make this trip? And we were asking our friends to pray with us and plan with us and whatever, and so we decided to go. We bought a collapsible wheelchair that was very lightweight. We had a cane that she took with us. And so we went, and we flew from... Los Angeles to Dallas, Dallas to Rome. We got a hotel in Rome, stayed a few days, got on a ship, and we went on the biggest floating thing I've ever seen. And we went around to uh, the Adriatic Sea, around the boot of Italy to the Adriatic Sea, and up into Greece, and little daily excursions all the time, pushed in the wheelchair. <laughs> and so Ruth felt the curvature of the earth, and so did I. And uh, then we came back. We saw Florence and Rome. 
and every cobblestone you can imagine, we felt. <laughs> but we made it. We came back. And you know, our friends who had prayed for us saw us and they said, well, was it worth it? <laughs> we, of course, said yes, it was. Even though we paid a big price and we saw Rome like we never had seen it before. But it was worth it. But that question hung up in my mind. And I think it's a fair question for us to ask ourselves. Is life worth living? I've spoken with people who have come to that point and they've said no. And they've tried to take their life. But how about you? Is that a question that we can wrestle with here? I think Paul wrestles with it in this passage. He's writing to a church that he has planted. People he dearly loves. And in the opening two chapters, he tells of his commitment to the gospel, of his love for them, and what it has cost him, even to the point of near death. And he says it's been worth it because he's been able to lift up Jesus and he calls the Philippians to follow in the humble serving ways of their Lord in their own lives, putting no confidence in the flesh. And as he closes his letter, he calls for a celebration of their faith. What might that look like in their relationships? the church together. Well, Paul, I think, first of all, says it would be a life of defiant joy. Rejoice in the Lord. Always rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Three times. In the message translation, Eugene Peterson translates this verse, celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in God. That's what Paul's saying to the Philippian church. And I was thinking about our own culture. Here, especially in Southern California, we are a culture built around entertainment and celebration. And as, cel as spontaneous celebrations have waned over the past years, we found we have to manufacture them. And so we take a, a, a holiday like Halloween. You know, when I was a kid growing up in Hollywood, we took Halloween and we'd go out and we'd We'd purchase a few bags of candy and we'd sit by the door and put it in the, the baskets of children coming by. Or, and then, or if we were children, we'd dress up. And we'd dress up in some crazy costume and go out and ask for candy. And we'd get candy. But, you know, it, wasn't, it, was, it was fun. But then, now, have you seen what Halloween is now? My goodness, they say it's the second most elaborate holiday in America after Christmas. Number two is Halloween. Can you imagine that? Or how about Independence Day? My goodness. We used to get a few sparklers, you remember? And light those little snakes that would squirm around in your driveway, you know, and maybe a pop here and there. But now, my goodness, I, you know, I, my July 4th began on about July 2nd. We live in Costa Mesa, and we can hear everything from Santa Ana all the way down to Newport Beach. And it was just wall to wall, this rolling thunder that just never ended. And we were grateful about 1 o'clock on July 5th, it stopped. But it just never ended. And I thought about all the thousands and thousands of dollars spent on those explosives, some legal, some illegal, but they sure made a bang, and it just 
showed how we've tried to make these celebrations more and more elaborate. We'll do anything and create any, or pay any price to create a celebration. But remember here, when Paul calls us to rejoice, he's in jail. He's in prison, either in Rome or maybe in Ephesus. We're not sure, but it's the early 60s A.D. And how must he be feeling? Paul has invested his life in preaching the gospel and going around the Mediterranean basin and sharing the good news of Christ, for which he has been beaten, he's suffered, he's been incarcerated, but he's here decided doesn't matter. I will have the joy that God promises. And he wants the Philippian Christians to have that same joy. Karl Barth, the great Reformed theologian, said, the joy Paul is feeling is a defiant nevertheless. Paul is drawing his strength from the rich hope of the gospel. And he says, joy is the serious business. I'm sorry, this is C.S. Lewis, not Bart. C.S. Lewis once said, joy is the serious business of heaven. It's the gospel truth, the grand truth. And it's the surprise that happens when we discover God's love. Joy is the serious business of heaven. We are a culture that settles for far less than for what God has for us in Christ. Lewis is speaking about how we fill our lives with things that don't really meet the needs we have for joy in any substantial way. It comes far less than what God has for us God's kind of joy is offered to us as His gift and is joy to the fullest as Jesus promised us in John's gospel. The Philippians need to hear this from Paul. And he remembered the early days when he and Silas arrived in Philippi. And they were alone and they met by the river and they met a, a woman by the name of Lydia. And Lydia was just a sweet lady. She took purple cloth, which was very expensive, and she wove it into garments, and she sold it. She was making a lot of money. And she listened to the gospel that they had to preach, and she gave her heart to Christ. And she invited Paul and Silas into her home. And there began the Philippian church as others came and they gathered for worship, and the Philippian church grew from those roots. And they had joyous worship there in her home. Now, years later, the church had grown, but it was suffering from disunion and division, which Paul, in his letter here, speaks to. And he recalls those days of great celebration and joy. And through that, he encourages us to be a contagious celebration of God's faithfulness. Rejoice! Rejoice always! Again I say, rejoice. Secondly, Paul speaks of a life of palpable gentleness. I'm not sure I would have thought of this if I was writing the Philippians, I'm glad that Paul was the one that did. But he says, let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. The word for gentleness is epie case. Sounds like kind of what we did when we would shout when we dress up as kids and as cowboys. And I'd come over here to Fullerton. I came to Fullerton to see my cousin David, and we'd dress up as cowboys, put a cowboy hat on, uh, strap in our holsters and our boots on, and we'd get our broomsticks. 
And we'd go, yippee ki yay yippee ki yay That's what I thought of when I heard this word. But it's really not. That's an English cowboy word. But it made me think of that. But this word is strange. It's, it's hard to translate, and it has a collaboration of meanings. But it boils down to a sweet, reasonable character. One of the most untranslatable words, but it really is a person who is considerate of the others around them. If you're blessed, you may be a person like that or you may know a person like that. I know that when I'm around them, I take note and I, I remember them more than others. My mother was like that most of the time. When I was with her, I sensed something of God in the room. It's not like she was simply sweet all the time. She could be very, very tough. But there was a soft, round, kind of empathic sensitivity about mom. And there it is. We often think about gentleness as a feminine characteristic. We don't think of our heroes being gentle. When you think of John Wayne or Clint Eastwood or Tom Cruise, that's not the first characteristic you think of. But it's one that requires a skill and a great courage, the courage to be gentle considerate and empathetic. I think there's something missing today from interactions between people, particularly in the world of politics. Can a politician be gentle and considerate with everybody talking and nobody listening? For many, the way of relating is shaped by the brusque, harsh world. A world of assertiveness, bluntness, curtness, and presumption. We're not hearing each other. We're not making helpful decisions. And as a culture, we will pay the price. Because it takes strength and discipline to form a character with compassion. It's like a skill to be developed. In Psychology Today, the magazine, Ryan Niemick had, is a psychologist and an author. He had an article and he said this, gentleness is like a character strength. It's like a person down on one knee looking a child in the eye and listening carefully, or a coach with a steady, comfortable smile as they lead under pressure, or someone listening to the pain expressed by a friend as they hold together their suffering, or one who attends to another without concern for their own personal agenda. This gentleness is no soft virtue. And it opens doors. Gentle folks are courteous. They show restraint and empathy and compassion. That's what brings results and solutions and new ways forward. It's like what we've seen this week from the residents in Lahaina, in Maui. Before any major organized relief comes their way, they're helping each other. They're reaching out and making sure everybody is accounted for as much as they can, helping people to safe ground or out of the city or into the water, whatever it took. That, that kind of responsive gentleness and decision-making collaboratively was there. Let your gentleness be evident to everyone. Show your tenderness. For God is at hand. When these things are in play, God is nearby. Thirdly, 
Paul talks about a life of grateful prayer. If you want to jump back a slide, you might get to that other one. Another one. We're almost there. A life of grateful prayer. Don't be anxious, Paul says. The Philippians apparently were habitual warriors. Uh, warriors, I should say. They weren't warriors. They were warriors. They were anxious people. And Paul says here, stop this. Let it go. All of it. Let it go. And he offers a solution. He says, in all things, with thankful hearts, let God know what you need. Now, Prayer and thanksgiving. He talks about those two qualities, those two characteristics. Both of them require faith because we're reaching out to someone greater than ourselves and we're asking for support. That requires faith in the person you're approaching. As we approach God with an honest vulnerability And we simply ask. We discover the peace of God. The peace that's above all understanding. And the peace that will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Robert Rohr, the author of the wonderful book, Breathing Under Water. He offers the uh, the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous and the Addicted. Something therapeutic there is that comes from opening up to a higher power. That opening up is therapeutic and it it brings a rush of resources and inspiration and encouragement. See, Paul is not offering any magical formula or nighttime ritual to erase our circumstances. Remember, Paul's in jail. He's locked up. And he's under the threat of death, but he knows his mission still lies ahead of him, and that's his focus. And when we hear about his travels, his incarcerations, his beatings, there had to be a stress and a worry that Paul carried. But the impact on Paul's life from that day on his road to Damascus, when Jesus appeared to him, the risen Lord, And in the days following, later when he met with the Lord in the wilderness and Christ, the risen Christ, taught him, they demanded Paul's attention. Now here, Paul didn't choose his circumstances, but he could choose how he would respond to his circumstances. And he always remembered this promise he quotes, The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And that carried him. That same peace is available to us today. What has you tied up in knots as you sit here and worship today? What's the anxiety you bring? Is it that medical report that you got to call the doctor about? Is it the mortgage payment? Do you have enough to carry on through the month? God has a way to cover us for those kinds of anxieties and transform them into the grist for growth to show God's glory. That's what Paul held on to. I had a call recently from a couple who felt that they had been wronged by their church. And as I listened, I heard the the pain that they were going through and they were thinking of leaving the church and they were really grieving. And I shared from my own experience and then I asked if I could pray for them. And I did and they thanked me and then they, a few days later, sent me a card in the mail. You still get things in the mail, you know, like from a post, uh, 
postal carrier and they slip it into your mail slot along with the volumes of advertisements. <laughs> there was a little card, a nice handwritten card, and it thanked me for contacting them and they said, here's to more learning about living our faith. See, it takes faith to say that. And they're moving forward. They're still in their circumstances, but they're moving forward held by God's hope. There's resolution. There's a way forward. There's reconciliation coming. God is at work in a mysterious way. So instead of groveling in the turmoil of our anxiety, we allow God to hold us in his peace that transcends all understanding and be better equipped to move beyond and above anything that stands in your way. Lastly, Paul talks about a life of worthwhile thinking. As you rejoice in all things with a gentle spirit and grateful prayers, Finally, dear friends, whatever is true and honorable, just, pure, whatever is pleasing and commendable, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. How can we live as God-focused, faithful followers of Jesus Christ if we're constantly feeding our minds on what the culture about us is telling us about what we should have? You need this. You will certainly want that. Don't miss out on this. You can't have life without this. And what does the this end up being? Paul says in Romans 12, don't be conformed or shaped by this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. When I hear these verses, I'm challenged because I start to think about the amount of time I spend looking at this little device that I carry around. I don't have my cell phone. I feel naked up here. Um, but we, how much time do we spend looking at that little screen and, and on Facebook and looking at Amazon or what have you? And then I'm challenged because I compare the time I spend doing that with the time I spend reading the Word of God in prayer memorizing scripture or whatever other beautiful, honorable, excellent thing I can focus my mind on. Think, Paul says, about these things. So Paul then adds, in conclusion, a kind of a postscript in this last chapter of his letter. And he says, keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the peace of God will be with you. Mm. Is that boasting? I remember the first time I ever read this, I thought, Paul's kind of arrogant, isn't he? Kind of puffing himself up for these people. But then I saw that Paul was writing to people that he had poured himself into. Years and years of relationship. He's bold enough to put his faith up as a pattern to follow. You've seen a living faith. You've seen what God can do with this ordinary person. And he offered his hand and said, come, learn from me. Take my hand and we can learn together. And it helped me realize again and again for those that I've grown up around. You know, I'm working, some of you know this, I'm working as an associate producer, imagine that, 
on a film on the life of Henrietta Mears. And we've spent the last two years interviewing people, and last week we were the Billy Graham family. And Billy Graham, a key person in Billy's life was Henrietta Mears when he came to Forest Home, which was another one of Henrietta Mears' uh, ministries and gospel light press all these but she was key in billy's life just before he started the famous los angeles crusade in 1949 so we're compiling all this information and i grew up in her sunday school program at hollywood church and i remembered all the sunday school teachers and all the counselors and all the, the, these women that would meet every Sunday morning, they should sit at a little desk and we'd come and we'd recite the scripture verses that we had memorized the previous week. And all those people that had invested their life into our lives. That's what Paul's doing. Paul's saying, see Christ in me. See what he has done with this ordinary life. Who is it who's watching you? Who is it who's poured their lives into your life? The reason for you being here today, your pastors, your teachers, your coaches, your friends, your parents. Who is watching you today? There are people around you today that you can invest your life into. Can you say to them, see Christ in me? You're not boasting. You're talking about what God can do with a committed life. That's what the church is about. I remember going to visit a, a man who poured his life into mine years ago. He was in a home under hospice care and we shared, we cried, we laughed, we remembered together. And as I was preparing to leave, he looked at me with that, those blue eyes and he said, Tim, life is all about relationships. It's all about relationships. And I thank God for the relationship I had with Don. He poured his life into mine, was one of the key people that moved me into the career path in the ministry, built me up, taught me the New Testament. I mean, over and over we intersected, and he poured his life into mine. Who are you pouring your life into today? Perhaps you have a chance to be a Sunday school teacher or lead a Bible study, or join a Bible study, or share the gospel with a granddaughter, or grandson, or a parent, or a friend, a neighbor, a colleague. That's the mission of Paul. That's why we're here today, is because he took seriously that mission, and he spread that word, that word that changed people that gave them the freedom and elation to celebrate, rejoice, rejoice again, rejoice. To have a gentle spirit, to pray thankfully, requesting God to fill our needs and to think the right things. Praise God, because we have a chance to share that promising message of the gospel. Lord, thank you for this time of worship and the time to expound on your word and to see the promise again fulfilled. Lord, I pray that every person here would have that hope as they leave this place this day that their life is ahead of them, that our life together is ahead of us, and that you're going to continue to do great things and even greater things because you are faithful. Thank you, God. We rejoice and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand, if you are able, and join us in our closing hymn?
Please be seated. Thank you, Pastor Tim, for a lot of food for thought, and you're always welcome back among us. It was a joyful sermon, and sometimes the prayers of intercession are not so joyful, so we do have to remember that all is in God's hands. The, um, you know about the basket out front, and uh, you're asked to put your own prayer concerns in those, and they will be on the screen during prayer time the following week, along with the people in our prayer letters. So during the time of silence in our intercessory prayers, please take a moment to bring the things that are on your heart personally to God. So please join me in prayer. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we recognize that prayers are the corner cornerstone of our faith, and we are so blessed to bring you our intercessory prayers to you seeking solace, guidance, and strength in times of adversity. And there is much adversity for which to pray. We give thanks and are blessed by a team of prayer warriors in our church, led by Marcia Gallivan, who set aside a time every week to meet and bring our prayer concerns before you. Guide their every thought. At the forefront of concerns today is the plight of the people of Maui as they seek to recover from the horrific fires that claimed lives and destroyed much of their treasured historic island. Our hearts are heavy and we can't even imagine their pain. We are so grateful for the rapid response of aid teams and thousands of goods being gathered to send. And we are grateful that resident Tom Don Carlson, son of Marilyn and Jack Carlson, is safe. There are so many people of the world that we continue to hold in prayer, those of war-torn countries, those suffering from the devastating consequences of abnormal weather events, those who flee from their country seeking a better and safer life, those who have lost lives due to gun violence, and a myriad of other woes. We continue to give thanks for the agencies and individuals who come to their aid. We give thanks for teachers everywhere in the new school year especially for our own Lighthouse Preschool. Please hold the teachers and the students in the palm of your hand. And we give thanks for happy events, such as the 53rd anniversary of Mary Jane and Bob Lent. But there are those in our congregation who need our prayers for their health and emotional well-being. We ask that you surround them with physical healing, emotional restoration, and renewed faith. We bring before you Joy Weston, who is taking her first steps toward recovery, Jan and Paul Jacobson, and Chris and Don Marshall, who deal with ongoing health issues. And now, in a time of silence, bring your prayers to God. We know that you have heard our prayers, Lord, and we rejoice in the knowledge that you indeed have the world in your hands, each and every one of us, and our faith is restored in this very same knowledge. Now please join me in the prayer taught to us by Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
Now is the time and the opportunity for you to return a portion of the blessings that God has bestowed on you. Will the ushers please come forward for the offering? Now's the time for us to stand and pass the peace of God to your neighbor. Please stand.
You know, before I go, I want to say thank you to Lynette and Bryce, wonderful solo, and the choir, the summer choir. Thank you to all of you. I'm sorry you had to hear the sermon from the rear. Well, I shouldn't have used that word. I'm sorry. But yeah, you stayed through it all. Thank you very much. The benediction that you say each week is from Richard Halverson. And Richard Halverson was one of Henrietta Mears' boys. He came to the Lord through her. He was discipled by her, and he went on to be in ministry, became the chaplain of the United States Senate, and wrote this great benediction. Receive the benediction. Now go in peace and bless the world, and remember you go nowhere by accident. Where you are going, God is sending you, and where you are, he has placed you. God has a purpose for your life right where you are. Christ Jesus, who indwells you, has something that he wants you to do in and through your life right where you are. Believe this and go in his love and in his grace and in his power. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.